Hi there and welcome to the first Abu Dhabi Bank Global Investment Outlook for Q1. I'm thrilled to be joined by Chris Langer from First Abu Dhabi Bank. Chris is the Head of Investment Strategy for Private Banking. Chris, thanks for joining me. Thank you very much. Let's get stuck in. So the US dollar, interest rates, they're on the rise. Where does that place emerging markets this year, Chris? Emerging markets never do very well when interest rates in the United States are going up because usually it pushes the dollar up, as you just mentioned. It might be a little bit different this time because China is on the opposite direction. So China is easing as the Fed is tightening. So emerging markets will have a tailwind. Some emerging markets will have a tailwind from that, particularly the emerging markets that are more focused on the commodity industry, such as Brazil, Indonesia, South Africa, for that matter. For the time being, though, they are still grappling with the high inflation from the very high fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus that they put during the pandemic. As they backtrack that fiscal stimulus and that monetary stimulus, their economies are gonna slow down. You have a high dollar, as you just said, that also slows down their economies. And that makes emerging markets go through a little bit of a travail for a while. Um, eventually, as this monetary stimulus is fully withdrawn and we're in a better situation, with the US, with China, you would see a lot of these local emerging markets become very attractive. That's probably something for the second half, maybe even early 2023. Um, last but not least, however, there's one emerging market that is in the absolute paradise place right now, and it's right here. It's the GCC countries. We have high oil prices. Um, we have financials are a very big component of the local stock markets. So rising interest rates in dollars are good, for peg currencies and banks and, and peg currencies around here, that's amazing for our local stock markets. So if you are in the emerging market space, the place you want to be is right here in the GCC. So if we could just backtrack again to China, um, as a country and over the past two years, they have been cutting down on leverage while the rest of the world has been pumping money out. So do you see them continuing to buck that trend? I believe so. Look, China is the factory of the world and what happened over the past two years is the Western countries, which is particularly the United States, the biggest economy in the world, is a services economy. People weren't able to go to bars, they weren't able to go to cinemas, they were just at home clicking on Amazon and buying stuff that's produced in China. So China rode this wave of fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus in the West with economic growth, even during the pandemic, if you see economic growth in China was very good. Um, now that the West is pulling back the monetary stimulus and the fiscal stimulus, China in its turn is going to have to add more stimulus. So I think it is going to buck the trend in that sense. Uh, we're going to see more monetary stimulus, more fiscal stimulus. They already cut rates twice this year. Let's see. I think so. Mm. Common prosperity. What does that mean for China and the rest of the world? That's a very interesting thing that people don't fully understand. Um, it is going to be very good for China in the long run. China, because of some of the policies that they had put in place in their previous eras, was going through some very important secular changes, demographic changes. For example, they had to change their single, single child policy. Now you can have up to three children in China. Um, and together with that comes common prosperity. So the idea of common prosperity is they want people to make money in the cities, urbanization to be finished in China. Right now in China, you go to the city to work, but sometimes you have a pass from your own hometown. So agriculture doesn't get developed fully, but you don't have a full citizenship in the city. They need to correct that, and they're doing that. So they want agriculture to be mechanized. They want large-scale agriculture to be more possible. You're doing away with the hukou system. They want people to have the ability to buy a house in a city to get married, to have three children, to continue the demographic growth, all of that goes through common prosperity. It's a very interesting concept. It's going to have very good, uh, it's very, it has potential to make China grow even faster in the future, but right now in the transition period, it might be a little bit scary. Mm, interesting. I'm sure in the, Q, uh, the Q2 investment outlook we can touch base on this more because it's very, very interesting. But let's move over to the stock markets, the big one in the US double digit growth, will it happen again this year? What's your thoughts? Well, if you asked me that in January, I probably wouldn't say it, in the first of January, I probably wouldn't say that because we were just coming from a record. Uh, but where we are right now, after a, a slight correction in the S&P 500, we might even have double digit growth. What's happening is the assets, uh, the, the ability of, of American companies to grow profits 
is much better now than it was before the pandemic, believe it or not. For example, return on assets for the S&P 500 now are at the highest in 30 years. The debt to assets, the leverage of S&P 500 companies is at the lowest in 30 years. So their ability to grow profit margins is very good. So what I think is analysts are still a little bit too bearish on the earnings side. They're expecting earnings not to grow so fast. They might grow a lot faster than expected but there might be some multiple compression. So if we're trading at 21, 22 times expected earnings now, we might be trading at 19, 18 times expected earnings, earnings at the end of the year, but the expected earnings part of the, the equation is gonna go up. So, so yes, we still expect the, the stock market to end significantly higher this year. Okay, uh, last question, being a bit cheeky, digitization and new investments into technology such as cryptocurrency. Maybe it's not a good time to talk about it at the moment with all the volatility, but the rewards are big. Maybe there's high risks. Can you, what can you say to the fab customers uh, about these new technologies? Cryptocurrency is based on blockchain technology. Blockchain technology is very interesting. It allows for people to make transactions without having the normal human checking. It's decentralized. It makes things a lot more efficient. For example, if you had a blockchain-based stock market, you would have what we call T0, settlement on the instant. It would require some more things. It's not that simple, but generally speaking, it's a very promising technology. How it's used now for cryptocurrency is very speculative. So we have steered away from getting involved in it. Uh, naturally, everybody is watching as there's a lot of interest in it, but the asset class itself is purely speculative. Um, the price of Bitcoin is determined by what the next person is willing to pay for it. And therefore, you cannot ascribe a proper price to it that goes beyond sentiment. So at this stage, uh, something interesting, something to watch, uh, a huge promising technology, but not something I'm very interested in in terms of investment. Chris Langer, always a pleasure, very insightful, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.